Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Rougarou Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Polina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello everybody and welcome to episode 343 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host Joey Coastman. I'm joined as ever by former heavyweight world title challenger, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, how you doing this week, my man? I'm going good, Bob. How about you, Joe? I'm doing well, my friend. I'm doing well. Always good when speaking with you, Eddie. Uh, We're going to dive straight into the review part of the show. Really just the one event to go over. So I'm going to fly through the the undercard to start with. Of course, it is that that card that took place at the T-Mobile Arena, Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, Eddie Hearn, Matram Boxing. It was on DAZN. Let's start with the undercard, like I said. Uh, Mark Castro with a win. He's now 7-0. and A unanimous decision over six rounds against Pedro Vicente, who's now 7-5 and five with a draw. Um, Zili Zhang now 24-0 and with a draw. A KO in the first round against late replacement Scott Alexander, who's now 16-5 and five with two draws. As we said on last week's show, Zili Zhang was, was set to take on Filip Hergovic. Hergovic... Uh, father passed away, so in stepped Sky Alexander, who I don't know had had really even trained, but anyway, he got banged out in a round and made Zili Zhang look good. Um, Shakram Giasov with a win on points, unanimously over ten. He's now thirteen and zero. He was able to uh, beat Christian Gomez, who's now twenty two and three with a draw. That one was for the vacant IBF North American welterweight title. Um, Gomez was down in the 4th round, the 7th round, and, and, and the 10th round. He did have a couple of moments himself, to be honest, but Giasov had way too much um, in the arsenal for uh, for Gomez. Um, Montana Love with a win. He's now 18-0 and with a draw. It was for the IBF North American Super Lightweight title. Um Gabriel Valenzuela was the was the the loser in this one, twenty five and three with a draw. Um, he was down in the first round. Valenzuela then uh, Montana Love goes down in round two, and I my pick for this fight was that Montana Love would win on points. So when he knocks a guy down in the first round, I'm thinking, oh maybe not. Then when he gets knocked down himself in round two, I'm thinking, whoa, this really isn't going the distance. But it did. Um, like I say. Um, he was down heavy that 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 second round knockdown. Love was down heavy, but like I say, ended up going the distance. And Montana Love won, and he is still on on a, on a, on a bit of a run. He's got a lot of momentum behind him. Um, and yeah, moving straight to the main event, Canelo now fifty seven and two with two draws. Dimitri Bivol twenty and zero, still undefeated, still the WBA. Super World Light Heavyweight Champion. Um, unbelievable. Scorecards completely uh, unanimous and all exactly the same. 115-113. Um, Tim Cheatham, Dave Moretti and Steve Weisfeld. We don't always see the judges uh, you know, agree. We see them disagree a hell of a lot. For them to have it scored exactly the same is... is uh, it's a good thing, I guess, really. It means that it's a good thing. And for them to have it unanimous as well to the rightful winner, Dimitri Bivol. Brilliant. I'm glad that there wasn't any controversy on the cards, but still didn't think it was as close as 7-5 for Bivol, which is what that amounts to. Um, especially after they they announced that the judges all had it four rounds to zero for Canelo after the first four rounds. That's incredible to me. Um, I'm going to run through what I saw of the fight. Round one, I felt, was a really hard round to score. And I will be honest, by the way, I will I will just say the first four rounds, they were hard rounds to score. 
they were hard rounds to score. They were close rounds. But there's no way in the world you could give all four to Canelo for me. So back to what I was saying. Round one, really hard round to score. Very fast-paced round. Unusual round one for a Canelo fight, I guess. Because Canelo came out much more aggressively than I'd seen him start fights before. I think I edged around just just to Bivol, uh, pretty much off of his jab. Round two, another really hard round to score. Canelo trapped Bivol on the ropes a couple of times, but Bivol was able to keep Canelo on the end of his shots for the most part. I, again, gave the round to Bivol, but I kind of wanted to go back in time and give the first round to Canelo because, again, it was so nip and tuck, but I would have gave the first two to Bivol, in all honesty. Um... So yeah, you know, two two nil to Bevel uh, to, to to Bevel or one one, however you want to see that. I, I've not not really got an issue. I, I just don't think you can give the first two to Canelo. Round three, as I said, another close round. Canelo was definitely starting to get a bit closer. He landed a couple of those nice signature uppercuts. Bevel was taking a lot of shots on the gloves though. Uh, Bevel for me again though, I felt just did enough to edge it. So again, I felt that he could be. Uh, you know, all three rounds to Bivol, but I can understand why some people could maybe have it 2-1 to Canelo, and already I've noted that scores were going to be all over the place at that point, because some people had it 3-0 to zero for Canelo, certainly the judges. Round four, another really close round, but for me, Bivol once again was keeping that tight guard, nothing was really landing cleanly on him, and Bivol was still letting his hands go in combination, so again, I gave it to Bivol. Um... Round five, I felt was a clear Bivol round. The accuracy was laser-like. Bivol even put Canelo on the ropes and nailed him with several big shots. Canelo was showing a great chin, which we know he possesses. And Bivol um, was starting to, you know, show off that confidence that, that really had been there all along. But it was starting to really shine through. And the discipline as well was, was excellent. Um, round six, again, I gave to Bivol. I was shocked to hear that Sean Porter had the fight 3-2 for Canelo after five rounds, um, especially uh, something that I should mention. Canelo landed six punches in round six. Um, round seven, another bivol round clearly for me. And again, I was stunned by how disciplined he was. He was incredible. Um, again, very brief notes on this. Round eight, um, a clear bivol round once again. Canelo's mouth was beginning to open wide. He was needing to breathe deep. He seemed to be gassing a little bit, you know, feeling the pace. So I had it 7-1 for Bivol in, 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 uh, after eight rounds. Um, I was starting to worry at uh, this point a little bit for Bivol because I was just thinking, are they going to actually give him the fight? If it continues like this, are they going to give him the fight? Because we've heard all about the controversy with scorecards surrounding Canelo, uh, especially in Vegas as well. Um, yeah, so... They, they, at this point, I think in round eight, brought up the CompuBox stats. And Bivol had actually landed double-figure punches in every single round up to that point. So eight rounds, um, or seven rounds, this it might have been uh, the, 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 you know... They said this during round eight, so I'm guessing maybe they were talking about the first seven rounds, not actually round eight itself. But those first seven rounds, according to CompuBox, Bivol had landed double-figure punches in every single round, and Canelo hadn't landed double-figure punches punches in any round so that right there would tell you that you know quite possibly Bivol could be seven to zero up here um round eight like I say I gave to Bivol as well um round nine I actually gave to Canelo I felt that Bivol went on the attack and Canelo showed off that sublime head movement that he's got and he made Bivol hit fresh air quite a lot so so for me that kind of seemed to um seem to I guess have an effect on Bivol he seemed to maybe punch himself out a tiny little bit and Canelo started to uh, you know go on the front foot and he landed more from what I could see there so I gave him that round I had it 7-2 after 9 round 10 I gave to Bivol um, Sergio Mora started to pick up on a point that I made on last week's show that Canelo isn't very fleet footed you know he's he's got heavy feet and Sergio Mora was describing that in commentary and those heavy feet were causing him issues um round 11 a big round for Dimitri Bivol he was you know the much crisper puncher uh, the conditioning as well of him needs to be applauded he looked much fresher than Canelo and considering uh, the punch output you know the concentration 
and the big fight occasion. It was extremely impressive. 9-2, and then round 12 was a close round. It didn't really matter. Um, Bivol absolutely dominated the fight from what I could see. And I wrote here, if we see Canelo win this or it's a draw, it's got to be, it has to be corruption for me. Um, so, yeah, very pleased for Bivol because, as we said, you know, he, he's a humble, very, very, very humble fighter. Um, doesn't, you know, doesn't talk bad on people, stuff like that. A lot of people weren't even interested in this fight because they didn't see that he'd have a chance in hell. And he has, you know, gone away, worked hard very clearly. And I just think that the fight itself, obviously, he was the he was the clear winner in everyone's eyes. And again, I just want to just an extra special mention once again to that conditioning that he possessed, that game plan that he followed with the discipline, and just the fact that he didn't let the big fight occasion get to him. I think it was such a special performance, Eddie, and in mm -hmm. a way, it was a huge upset in people's eyes, but I want to say it's not going to be upset of the year or anything like that, because Bivol, for those that really do know, know that he's he's absolute top quality. And we outlined so many things on last week's show, Eddie, that ended up happening. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy that we had that discussion in depth. But we talked yep. about the, the punches in bunches, the, the, the quicker feet, you know, the size, the jab. And we talked about how this could give Canelo issues. He had everything to give him issues. And he, he put mm -hmm. it all on display. Yep. He showed, he showed exactly who he was on the night. And it's it's awesome to see that for him. I'm happy for him. Um, the judges were a little bit off, <laughs> to say the least. Most I could have said was 8-4. That was the best I could have done, you know, for, for Canelo. I I said, and anytime you judge fights, you got to give it – I mean, I know you can give your own card, and, Joe, you, you gave your card is what you believe to see. There could have been some swing rounds, like you said. It could have easily be two one, or in the first three rounds, which could have been. And my card was like, it's 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 interesting in the first half of the fight. I wasn't really judging it, like you know, per round. I was just watching the you know how the fight was going, and I would look at rounds and say, damn. And I was just watching, like, wow, Bivol was really doing exactly what we said was possible, right? Like, he was keeping him on the end of the jab. He was throwing odd combinations. Sometimes was throwing, you know, one-two-ones instead of one-two-threes. Sometimes two-one-twos and all kind of crazy combinations and counter shots. And some of the hooks he threw were even more angular, not necessarily hooks. They were almost more straight. And Canelo just wasn't prepared for those kinds of things. And I think another thing should be highlighted, too, is as talented and as tough and as strong as Canelo is and then moving up his weight class... The problem, I think, in this particular situation was Canelo's lack of really planning. I don't think he planned. I think he went in and figured that I'm Canelo. I beat everybody else in these weight classes, basically. Not everybody else, but, you know, I've beat, beaten guys up to this weight. I've beat Kovalev. I feel like, you know, regardless of what, what, what Kovalev he beat, I stopped him. So I feel like my punching power, my strength, my, my overall ability is going to win the fight. My aggressive, my, 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 you know, that's why he came in, I think, ultra aggressive. I think he came in trying to put his hands on, on Bivol, thinking it was going to scare him, thinking it was going to put him kind of like, oh, I'm just going to, you know, stand with my hands up and not fight and not throw. And I think Bivol's thing was he figured as much. I think he understood what he had to do. He said, I got to keep him on the end of my punches. I got to, I got to keep this range. I got to keep my left hand in front of him, keep my left hand on him, not allow him to sustain that attack. And if you notice, every single time, with the exception of a few times, his back touched the ropes, he would immediately get to the center. Immediately circle to the center. And then he would get Canelo on the ropes. And because you highlighted earlier about his heavy feet and him not willing to be, not really willing to do anything with his feet, he ended up getting himself caught in, on the ropes and multiple shots would be thrown. And I think that was the difference. I think it was Dimitri Bilbo's ability to keep with his game plan and, Pinello, and Canelo's lack of one. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying that Canelo, this, uh, Canelo disrespected him or didn't really uh, prepare as he should have. I think he prepared great. I think he was in shape. I think he was ready to go. But I think his, his lack of, of really a plan, so to speak, going into the fight of how he was going to – I think his plan was to 
I'm going to impress this guy with my power, shock him into basically keeping his hands up and not being really firing back. And I think he really had a real serious misunderstanding of who Dimitri Bivol was. Very proud, uh, great amateur background, great boxer, knew exactly what he needed to do to win. And he kind of went back a little bit to the amateurs a little bit in certain aspects where he was like keeping them on the end of his shots, you know, keeping the range, not allowing him to really get too close, uh, you know, for too long. And uh, game plan, I think, was pretty flawless. And I think if the rematch is going to happen, Canelo's going to have to understand that he's going to have to come off that bravado, come off that, you know, I could just walk guys down and dominate them and bomb them out. It's not going to work with this guy. He's going to have to have a real game plan. And I have to figure out how to take a page out of Floyd's book a little bit and use range. Because he has the speed, he has the ability, and I think he could have the feet. It's going to be kind of hard to train it in one camp, but he could. I don't know if he's going to be able to beat Bivol with it, but he definitely can make it a little more interesting than this this this, this fight. Because I just think he, I just think that Bivol, the way he boxed, the way he moved, Canelo's not going to be able to do what he tried to do in this fight. The kid is just too strong. His armor was a lot stronger than he thought it would be. He was able to defend. He wasn't getting hit very much except for on the arms, which I think was by design for Canelo, which was a good plan, but it just took too much out of Canelo and he didn't have enough in the way of a, a backup plan if that wasn't working. So, you know, all in all, Dimitri Bevel proved he is in the, the elite of the elite. And if there is a rematch, I would be interested in see what adjustments Canelo can make to actually – be more competitive because I don't think this was that competitive to be honest um, in this particular fight. So and won the next fight. So interesting. I loved it. I'm happy to see Bivol, do, you know, win the fight and, and, and he deserved to. And um, hopefully, hopefully we'll see a good fight. if it's, if there's a rematch. Yeah. And you certainly wouldn't write Canelo off in the rematch either. Cause we all know how good he is. Um, I remember speaking on last week's show and just kind of highlighting the fact that um, I, I guess I didn't say it as clear as I'm about to say it now, but I'm going to say it very clear now. Canelo doesn't really get people out early on. He really doesn't. He tends to come on strong as the fight goes on. He, he tends to break people's hearts. And it brings me back to the likes of the Plant stoppage in the 11th, the Billy Joe Saunders stoppage in the 8th. Um, he ended up going the distance with Callum Smith. Um, Sergei Kovalev, the stoppage in the 11th. He ended up going the distance with Danny Jacobs. The only time he's knocked people out early, I've, I've skipped over him there, but it's Avni Yildirim and it's Rocky Fielding. Both guys he took out in, in uh, three rounds. But they're way below the level of the guys that I've been mentioning there. Obviously went the distance with Golovkin in two back-to-back fights. The fight before that went the distance with Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. The fight before that knocks out Liam Smith in round nine. The fight before that he, he actually goes to round six with Amir Khan. He's always been a guy that comes on strong and kind of gets the stoppage late on. So... um True. So I was waiting to see what was going to happen late on, but, he, you know, Bivol had so much more than I think Canelo expected him to have late on, and it goes to it, go, it goes back to what I was saying about his conditioning and, you know, the unbelievable accuracy, the fact that he put a dent in Canelo pretty much straight away, and I just, mm-hmm. I just don't remember Bivol even missing many shots. I mean, Canelo <laughs> has got such great lateral movement, head movement, but... I just don't remember Bivol missing much. And as you said as well, every time he'd be on the ropes, he'd find his way back to the center of the ring. And every time Canelo would would land an eye-catching combination, he'd fire straight back, you know? Nothing mm-hmm. seemed to phase Bivol at all. Um, right. I think he was excellent. Um, but yeah, we've I got... Agree. A, we've, we've got... Uh, a, sorry, Eddie, go on. Go no, 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 I was going to say I agree 100%. Yeah. Uh, anytime, anytime, you know, Canelo would mount any kind of an attack, an attack here comes Bivol with something back. And he wasn't going to get the shock from Bivol, like, oh, my God, that was so hard. I got to keep my hands up and not be offensive. It was, just wasn't going to happen. And I think that was the huge difference, too. Yeah, and also I think Bivol's got such a great poker face as well. He was kind of waiting for, for a reaction, as you say, and he didn't get one at all. And, um, you know, Bivol, his face never changes no matter what's going on. 
Um, I, as I said, gave Canelo two rounds. I think at the very best, you could probably give him four. Um, and that's really at the very best. I don't think you can you can give him five. You certainly can't give him six. And never in a trillion years could you give him seven. Uh, if the rematch happens, like I say, we're all going to tune in once again. Canelo's going to make a truckload of money once again. And it, it, it's, not a, it's not a foregone conclusion when Canelo's involved. Um, we've got to give Canelo credit as well for taking this dangerous fight. A lot of people didn't recognize it as a more dangerous fight than a Benavidez or a Charlo, um, unfortunately. So he didn't really get the credit. And Bivol is kind of in a lot of casual boxing fans' brains has just come out of nowhere where that completely wasn't the case. Um, last, last little topic of discussion on this, Eddie, because we want to bring part one to a close quite quickly. But... I guess before this fight, I'm not sure who was your number one pound for pound fighter in the world, but let's just say for a moment here, was it Canelo or, or was it not? Yeah, it yeah, was, it was Canelo. Canelo. It was okay. Canelo yeah. So before the Canelo. fight, he's a pound for pound number one. Um, as soon as the uh, you know the the fight played out and we got the decision that Bivol had won the fight. Um, Terence Crawford went straight on Twitter to say, "Now we know who's number one." Obviously speaking about himself understandable um canelo did move obviously out of his comfortable weight for this fight here a loss to bivol in that fashion does that mean that he loses the number one pound for pound spot is is such a open discussion some people think think yes certainly some people think no because obviously if a flyweight that so let's talk about naoya inue for example a fantastic fighter down there at is it bantamweight, super bantamweight, whatever? I think it's bantamweight. If he were to take on Tyson Fury at heavyweight, he's going to lose the fight. Doesn't <laughs> mean that he should lose his position in the pound for pound rankings. So, where Fact. do you sit on that? I, I agree to a degree that it doesn't necessarily mean he's going to lose it. But the problem with this ideology is, is, is it's like I see him going up and he beat Kovalev. Yeah. So, it's like, oh, so he beat Kovalev. It is only one, and, and, and it is because he and he and he he's the undisputed sixty-eight pounder, and there's only one weight class up to seventy-five. So it's kind of hard to say, well, should he lose his spot? But he's really a hundred and sixty pounder. But then he uh, unif he he uh, he's an undisputed at one sixty-eight. It's just it's a tough question to ask. But if 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 he loses his spot, then you know. <laughs> Dare we say Bivol is now he is he now in the pound for pound conversation as one of the top guys pound for pound? Is that something that catapults him in there? And and then Terrence Crawford saying saying that, but Terrence Crawford's been pretty safe at 140, 147. And does he have the resume now, even even after beating he did beat Sean Porter, but does he have the, the resume to be that? You know what I'm saying? I don't know. There's a lot of ifs with this whole pound for pound thing. But Canelo is definitely the most qualified, even after the loss, to be pound for pound number one, too. Because he did, he is undisputed, only undisputed, I think, or the first 168 pounder. 160, he was, I don't know if he was undisputed. I can't remember uh, there. He's, he was a unified champion there. He beat, he beat Triple G, the biggest boogeyman at 160 at the time. Uh, he's won other fights. He's beat other top guys. So I think his resume holds to be that. As current, he just lost to Bivol. I don't know. I don't know where I stand on that. That's a tough question. That's a good question, though, Joe. I think that's something you should ask pose to the listeners. Like, what do they think? Because it's very interesting that. Well, we're always open to listeners' feedback, certainly when it comes to these uh, hot topics, these these debatable discussions, because I was was kind of comparing it for -hmm. good reason to when obviously Lomachenko was being spoke about as like the, the number one or number two pound for pound whatever then he lost right. to Tiafimo Lopez and then all of a sudden Lopez is gate crashing the top 10 list when prior mm-hmm. to beating Lomachenko which we know was a close fight by the way some people even mm-hmm. scored it to Lomachenko prior to mm-hmm. that he didn't really have a fantastic resume don't get me wrong he did bounce Richard Comey off the ground in about two rounds and Comey was a former world champion that was very impressive Impressive, but that was was a, a a catastrophic jump up in class from the guys he'd been fighting to Comey, mm. got him out in two rounds, and that's another situation where 
you know, Canelo, sorry, not Canelo, uh, Lomachenko had gone up to a weight class at lightweight mm-hmm. where he's not most comfortable, like Canelo's done at, at 175. Can you put yep. Bivol in? I mean, I don't know, because he's beaten potentially the best fighter in the world pound for pound, but it's because maybe he's at a weight disadvantage that that's why you've got the win. I don't know, because again, hard to say. look at how Bivol beat Canelo compared to how... Uh, how how Lopez beat Lomachenko? That was a close fight. This wasn't in most people's no. eyes. So right, right. There's right. no right so and wrong answer. It's just this is why the sport is so uh, just based off of yeah. opinions. Really, I mean that's how it is. Right. Let's be completely honest, Eddie. I mean there's there's yeah. all these sanctioning bodies have got rankings. It's all based on opinions. If they don't think you're Facts. the best fifteen then you're not going to win a world title. It's impossible. <laughs> One million percent. That's a hundred. Like, there's so many guys who could be out of the top 15 and or rated in the top 15 in other organizations that are better than the top 15. It's just wild. It's wild how this thing, thing is, but it's 1 million percent. All opinions <laughs> of the people who are in power. And I think that that makes it tough. That makes it tough because then if not if not their, their opinions, then whose opinions? You know what I mean? Would it be the fans? You know what I mean? But then you got to be careful because then, you know, if we're, if we're talking about fans, then you never know how many of these fans are actually knowledgeable. So, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's, it's a loaded question. There's, there's a good, there's a couple of great, a couple of great questions, Joe. I got to say. Yeah. I like and, these. <laughs> and, and as you mentioned as well, just to cap it off, as you mentioned there, that there are guys that are not ranked in the top 15 that would beat guys that are ranked in the top 15. And maybe they're not Facts. They're not in that top 15 because who knows? Maybe they're not with a big promoter or they haven't been on TV and they haven't been uh-huh. seen by a worldwide audience to have that demand. But yes, there's sir. also, I'd even go as far as to say there's WBA world champions or versions of a WBA world champion. I think WBA have got interim champions, regular champions, super champions. There are mm. some title holders that are not as good as some guys that are, let alone in the top 15, probably in the top 30. And uh-huh. um, it just it just makes you shrug your shoulders. It is such a... Who would who who knows anything about boxing anymore, Eddie? It's just a you can <laughs> you can't. It's like this. No one it's knows all, anything. <laughs> it's all politics, man. It's like you think you think the elections are crazy. Go to look, <laughs> listen to the listen to the rankings in boxing, and you're like, how the hell is this guy here? Like, how is this guy a world champion? He's not even in the top fifty in this other organization. But maybe his promoter has a good relationship with this guy and got him a title shot. And I'm not going to say any names or pick any guys out. But the fact is, it's really bananas how they got this, this whole thing going. It's crazy. You think you would think that it would be simpler. You know what I mean? But it's just not. And there's so many different organizations. And there's others like the IBO who's starting to gain more credibility. So now there's a fifth title out there that people want to own. And it's just like... How many champions are we going to have? Who? How can you decipher who's the who's real and who's fake? You know. Yeah, no, absolutely. And back to the WBA. I think I've told the story on the podcast before. In the past, they actually uh, had a guy in their rankings. He was in the top fifteen, and I think he was ranked uh, maybe ranked fourteenth or something like that. And then he actually he actually passed away and in the next month's rankings he'd gone up to 11th while while being deceased so get your head around that one whoa it's happened oh lord that is unreal yeah unreal that's that's the headline a dead guy moves up in rankings with a wba but that's a story if you don't know for another day you can google that one it is uh it's, it's it's tragic but it's also hilarious for the for the blooper um anyway yeah. that brings the review part to a close that is the end of part one the final thing for me to do is to welcome this week's special guest ladies and gentlemen please welcome the undefeated wbc and ibf super lightweight female champion of the world it is of course miss chantelle cameron chantelle welcome back on the show thanks for having me back on hope you're good 
I'm always good when I'm speaking with you, Chantel. That's the truth. So, we, we, no, no problem. We last spoke back in September. It was just a few weeks before yeah. your last fight, that unification with Mary McGee. Um, as I yeah. say, it was a real pleasure to, to, to sit ringside for it. What an amazing fight. I, I could tell that you had fun in there. Um, how enjoyable was that fight for you, Chantel, looking back? I absolutely loved it. Yeah, my, yeah. Well, I've always said I wanted a fight where I have to grip down and bite down on my gum shield and show people that I've got what it takes to go to any pace and I can box, I can fight, I can take a punch, I can give a punch. And I think for that, that fight kind of uh, proved that. And there was times in that fight where I didn't even have to stand there and trade verb, but I wanted to. Like, I could have made that a much easier fight if I just boxed. I think... Uh, I'd say she won about two rounds out of ten. And that was just because I was just having fun standing side to try. Like, she wasn't hurting me. Um, like, it was just a good good, like, good war, really. Yeah, like, there's not was... once where she, she hurt me. Like, afterwards, my face looks all grazed up and that, but that was from the gloves. That, like, no leather marks. Yeah, no, absolutely. And like I say, it was it was hard to give her uh, many rounds at all. Um, and yeah, you showed, you know, your fighting, your boxing, even a little bit of wrestling. I think she ended up on the deck at the end of one of the rounds as well. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that was just, just to prove that I'm strong. <laughs> <laughs> I felt sorry for just, her for a just second. Just to let there. her know. <laughs> but I actually okay. done something the other day. I got tagged in something. And I'm just thinking, I'm never getting into it. I've got my own fight um, coming up. Like she's making excuses now that um, I've pushed her to deliberately damage her knee or some rubbish. And I'm just thinking, oh, shut up. Like, you really, you had older me and I flung you. And that was it. There was no plan to bush your knee or anything. I didn't need to do that. I was going to, I would outbox you regardless of a knee injury or not. And I'm not really that uh, malicious to deliberately try to injure someone in the ring. I'm not cheap. Yeah, no, I understand that. I agree. I've seen it, and I was just thought, oh god, excuses like just take a lot. Yeah, no, no, I agree. Um, I agree. I mean, I think that I think she needs to get back in the ring. It's this is pretty got nothing to do really with our chat today, but she needs to get back in the ring. Obviously, in her, she's in her a, spare she's time, she's been fighter. like. No, she is, she is. But in her spare time, yeah, I don't know if yeah. you've seen her Instagram. She's turned into a little bit of an Instagram comedian instead of fighting uh, recently. But all is well. Um, yeah, so I just it was... got tagged in there. Some things saying that I'm a dirty fighter. But mm. first of all, it was her weight cut. And now it's her knee. And now I'm a dirty fighter. I tried damaging the knee. And it's like, six months ago, I let it go. Yeah, like, yeah. you lost. And the, the rematch will happily happen. But on my terms, when it's right for me, like, my career is moving forward. And I took your belt. That's it. Yeah. Go, um... go. go, go do your work and become champion again but until then like my career is not going to be waiting around for a give her a rematch for sure and as I say, it was a really excellent fight. It was right up there with, yeah. I guess, like uh, Michaela Mayer and uh, and Maver Hamadouche, which was arguably fight of the oh, year last year. Fight. Yeah, wicked fight. Yeah, and obviously, fight. just the other day, another brilliant women's fight, Katie Taylor, Amanda Serrano. What did you think of that? And did you feel that the right lady won? I do think the right lady won. I think uh, it was a close fight. And to be fair, I think, it could have gone either way. I think if Savannah got the decision, you wouldn't complain. Katie got the decision, you can't complain. It was a very, very good fight. And obviously, uh, I think the fifth round, Amanda almost had her out of there. And I thought, really, you know, like, what, coming into the sixth, how's Katie going to be? But I'll tell you what, Katie showed some heart and courage because she got through it and she started nicking the rounds again. But um, yeah, what a fight. Incredible. Yeah, it really was. It was excellent. Um, after your fight with McGee, you, of course, travelled out to the States yourself. You were ringside for Callie Reese against Jessica Kamara. Um, you did this because we were told about this mini tournament between the winner of your yeah. fight, the winner of their fight. I haven't heard anything else about the final. Um, what is going on with that, Chantel? Do you know what? You know more than me. I oh, have no. no idea. Literally no idea. Um so it's been a bit of a rubbish time for me because I had that fight, won the semi-final, and then I was told February, March, I was going to be fighting the final. That's why I went over to America to watch their semi-final to see who I'll be facing. Then I was told um, the final will be happening in February, March, 
but I did see an interview with Kelly Vies where um, I think it was Shadowbox or someone saying that um, her body needs a rest and she won't be fighting until May, June. And I thought, oh, that's a bit weird because I've been told February, March, but I thought nothing off it thinking it must just be mixed wires or something. And then uh, got to January and there was no fight day, uh, heard absolutely nothing. Then I started thinking like, what is going on? Like, why have I not heard about anything? So my team were chasing it and seeing like, what was going on. And then we got told there was some medical issues. So it was like, okay, like, well, what's that going to mean for the fight? Is how long is the delay going to be? Like, kind of, we need, we wanted answers, especially for me because I was um, up there and I wanted to be active, to be out there, keeping busy, get my profile built more because I don't think my profile is like doing any good at all at the moment. And um, we were still waiting. And I think it was like end of February that we was told Caddy's not going to be ready. Um, they were looking at an interim fight for me. I was told that would be April, but didn't get the fight in April. And then, luckily, I've been put on May the 21st bill and I'm going to have a title defence against Victoria Buster. But, obviously, that's my main focus now, was the thing. If I lose to Victoria Buster, then my belts have gone anywhere. So that is my main focus. But beyond, like, after that, as long as I get through Victoria... I still have no idea about the final, if it's going to happen or not. So I don't really know where that stands at all. Yeah, that's a great shame because, like I say, I mean, both fights were really good fights as well. Like, your fight with McGee was good. The Kamara and Reese fight was really good. I mean, it was quite controversial. Yeah. A lot of people felt Kamara did enough to win. And then it kind of, it, it made, I think, everyone quite excited for, for the final. Yeah, really. so, um, it was. It's it was really uh, sad. The hype was around it and... The hype was around it. Um, I just had my win. She just had her win. And it was building. It was like the first female tournament as well for Undisputed. Like there was a lot of hype around it. And then literally it just it just stopped and it just went under the radar. And it was like, what's happening with this tournament? What, it's it just completely just gone under the radar. And then my whole career went under the radar because nothing was going on for me. So I lost sponsors. People were saying, like, what's going on? She said, like, what, what happened to the fight? And I, I couldn't give anyone an answer. And uh, it just basically just put my career back again because it's just it's not been a good image for me. And people that were sponsoring me, like, they've not been very satisfied because, obviously, if I'm not getting promoted and stuff. They're not getting anything from their sponsorship being and that. But luckily, I've had a good few loyal ones that have stood by me. But with the Kamala fight, like I said, I, I thought Kamala won. And that's what the uh, the most frustrating thing is, is if Kamara did get that decision, the fight would have happened by now. So it's quite a bit of a bitter one for me, because I think, oh, just what bad luck. Yeah, you haven't had it easy outside of the ring, I tell you, man. I mean, you know that yourself. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's been a rough ride. There's someone looking down on me, thinking this girl is not going to get where she wants to get to anytime soon. Oh man, don't say that. You've been you've been excellent. Obviously, it's, everything's fantastic. You got two of the belts. You're number one in the world. I think everyone yeah. really knows that. And um and and you know, I think maybe when Katie Taylor retires, everything's gonna <laughs> start picking up. <laughs> maybe that's Hopefully, what it is. Yeah. Hopefully, then the, the the boxing people start looking after me a bit better and actually start giving me the opportunities. Yeah, and talking of, I guess, bad it's a bit luck. Frustrating. Yeah, no, I can imagine. And talking of bad luck and stuff like that, I've got to ask, how is Jack Catterall getting on? I haven't, uh, I haven't spoken to him or anything recently. I haven't spoke to him since since the fight, really. But is he okay now? Yeah, he's back in the gym. He's been back in the gym for a while now, to be honest. Um, he's just ticking over, back in the gym. And I think himself, he's just waiting for his date. But he's actually he's been helping me prepare for this fight as well. He did some miles with me the other day. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. And, um, Can I give it a spell? 
Yeah, exactly. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, I was. I was wondering. I, I was thinking you, you're like the same way. I reckon you've probably done a few rounds, so I'm not surprised to hear it. Um, your next fight, obviously, as you mentioned, uh, May 21st, back at the O2 again. It's going to be part of that yeah. Boatsy Richards undercard. You'll be boxing, as you mentioned, Victoria Bustos of Argentina, former two weight world champion. Um, what else do you know about her, Chantal? She's tough. She's durable. She's box. All the top girls, she boxed Katie, she boxed McCaskill, she's boxed with Celia. So, do you know what I mean? She's been in there with world class operators. So, for me, it's to prove myself. I've got a massive point to prove. And I think that's what I've got to do is show people, like, don't put me in a corner and don't, don't forget about me. Like, I'm still here and I've got to put on a good performance to make people remember that. And obviously, you didn't just mention there, but I'm sure you know already, she's never been stopped. I'm guessing that's something yeah. that really excites you. I know the way you think. Yeah, yeah, but like I say, I never looked for the stoppage. But um, Yeah, I don't like, believe you. Like, Jamie, <laughs> Jamie and that are saying like she's never been stopped. Like, this is a good chance. Yeah. But I'm not going to go looking for it, but uh, I'm feeling strong. I've been doing a lot of work with Kerry Kays, and uh, I never felt so strong. So, yeah, I'll just... Uh, let my hands go and don't, don't talk the talk you've got to walk the walk and I <laughs> and obviously <laughs> we do really badly want to see that Callie Reese fight I'm sure she's on the top yeah. of your radar you want to be undisputed um, is is there anyone else who comes close to her on your radar just yet you know what like I think it's because of the last few months it was all I was focused on is undisputed and having all the belts and stuff but I kind of just now I'm just like I just want to fight like, I just want to be active and I want to be fighting and that's it I think uh, I put so much of my heart into becoming undisputed and being so determined and so adamant I was going to become undisputed champion and with this big delay and then not knowing what's happening I think I've kind of had to take myself away from that because it just makes me a bit angry and a bit bit frustrated so I'm kind of now I'm just like get through Victoria and then whatever happens after that happens but as long as I'm kept busy and as long as I'm acting as long as I'm put out there more yeah no for sure and just finally before we wrap it up Chantel if you've got any closing words just to the listeners um, I always like to give you an opportunity just to sign out with a message or or anything that you want to say before we let you go so take it away Hopefully you can tune in May the 21st on the line because I'm looking to put on a big performance and a big statement. I've missed being in the ring and having a scrap, so May the 21st is going to be all guns blazing. All guns blazing. Back at the O2, as we say, against <laughs> against Bustos, a lady that's never been stopped. Chantel, I think, has got a lot of frustration to let out. Listen, <laughs> Chantel, it's always a pleasure speaking with you. Best of luck ah, for May 21st, and we'll speak sometime after. Appreciate that. Thanks for your time. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part of the show. We're going to start here with this one. It takes place June 11th. It's a double um, It's a double card on BT Sport. So the headliner in the UK, this one goes down in Telford. We're going to see Mark Leach. Um, who's coming off that brilliant win last time out. I can't remember who he beat now. I think he beat a guy at York Hall. Um, he gets in with yeah with, with Liam Davies. That's, that's going to be a really, really good fight there. Liam Davies, I think I've seen once or twice live. Um, so that's, that's a brilliant fight there. Also on the undercard as well, we get to see the third fight between Casey Kadami, friend of the show, and Ilyaz or Ayaz Ahmed. Uh, so yeah, I think the first fight was a win for um, Ahmed, and the second fight was a draw, and this is the third fight, so we shall see what happens there, uh, that's going to be great, um, that's about it for that one, but that's the UK card, then it goes over to the States, um, I'm not sure how they're going to do this, if, if the timing's going to go straight from the UK to the US or if there's going to be some kind of break in the middle but we're going to see two cards in one night there and the headliner uh, that 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 takes place in the US we're going to see I kind of alluded to him a little bit without saying his name I spoke about WBA title holders not perhaps being as good as some of the guys in the rankings and yeah uh, Trevor Bryan uh, 22 and 0 15 KOs defends his WBA uh, world title against 
Daniel Dubois, 17 and 1, <laughs> 16 KOs. Someone going to sleep there for sure, I'd say. Um, so, yeah, that's June 11th. Uh, Go on. Wow. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Joe. I just had to say it. It's funny that you were saying what you were saying because I was the exact thing I was thinking. No disrespect, and I didn't want to say names, but that is crazy how that is exactly the person that I was thinking, like, how did this happen? But, hey, it's boxing. Oh, man. Um, okay. June 11th again, this one at the Madison Square Garden. Edgar Balanga gets in with um, Alexis Angulo. It's not a fight I particularly like, but um, I think that's giving Balanga a chance to get back on the knockout. Uh, the knockout runs and stuff. Um, again, we spoke to David Benavidez on last week's show. It was cool when I asked him about Belanga, and he was saying that, um, you know, he needs to stop calling me out if he's not ready for the fight because I'm here ready waiting for the fight, and when the fight will happen, he will be knocked out. So there was some fighting talk there from Benavidez, who is admittedly a few levels above Belanga at the moment. And on the undercard as well, um, Xander Zayas, the Puerto Rican uh, Phenom, I think it's fair to say at this stage. He's going to be on that undercard as well. Um, so yeah, that's June 11th, so a lot going on there. Uh, what else do we have? What else do we have? Ben Whitaker, the Olympic silver medalist, just won at Olympic silver um, at the Tokyo 2020 slash 2021 Games um, last year. He has signed a, prom- a promotional contract with Boxer, so he's going to be boxing on uh, on Sky Sports, so that's fantastic for Sky Sports subscribers. Um, what else do we have? I think this is the final piece of news. Um, Jason Maloney gets in with Aston Palikte. That's a bantamweight fight there. That is part of the undercard um, that we're going to see on June 4th between... Uh, that's that's on the undercard of Devin Haney and George Cambosos. Another one who I don't want to get back to what we were talking about in part one but George Cambosos has just beaten um, has just beaten um, Tiafimo Lopez if Lopez was in the rankings then can Cambosos get in the rankings no one's really talking about him in the top 10 or anything like that and he's also got wins over former world champions Mickey Bay and Lee Selby so more than uh, the likes of Haney more than the likes of uh, uh, Tiafimo Lopez so I don't know it's just crazy this boxing ranking stuff but anyways um, so yeah on his undercard on, on Cambosos and Haney's undercard we're going to see Jason Maloney against Aston Palikte and also a heavyweight showdown between Junior Farr and Lucas Brown I love Lucas Brown friend of the show but I can't quite believe he's still fighting and he's getting in another really dangerous fight here I cannot see anything else apart from him being knocked out early as well so um yeah i mean i hope i'm wrong uh, anyway that's it for the news part of the show moving out now to tomorrow night friday the 13th is there going to be some unlucky stuff going down we shall see it's going down though at the in, at the indigo at the o2 in greenwich london uh, this one's going to be on channel five wow i didn't expect that i'm going to definitely set that up to tape or watch it live um I think the main event is Lina Shudofia, 17-0, getting in with Denzel Bentley, 15-1 and with a draw. Both guys, 17 fights into their pro career. Denzel Bentley, of course, mixed it at a slightly higher level and also picked up a loss in doing so when he got erased by um, by Felix Cash, when Felix Cash really shone through. I think he was even the underdog, if I'm not mistaken. This one's for the vacant British middleweight title. Um that's going to be a brilliant fight. Really looking forward to it because Eudofia has come through on the small hall circuit. Um, you know, hasn't... I don't know, it's hard to say. I don't think I'd say he's had it the hard way as such. But he has improved recently. And I think because he's improved recently, this has made the fight a lot bigger. I think Bentley, in my eyes, is still... Uh, the favourite in my eyes, but actually with the bookies, they cannot split them. They cannot split them. They're exactly the same price, which uh, which is bad because neither of them you can double your money on. It's just slightly underneath that. So, yeah, <laughs> it's almost uh, terrible for betting on that fight there. But yeah, I think Denzel Bentley should 
should have too much for you, Dofi, but we'll see. Uh, return to the ring for friend of the show, Josh Kelly, 10-1 and one with a draw. I want to say it's his first fight back after losing to David Avenesian. Um He's in a 10-rounder here against Zulio um, Vrenosi. I think I've seen the name before, 18-4, and four, uh, over 10 rounds. Been stopped three times in those four losses, and I have totally forgotten who he's been in with, so I'm just going to quickly double check there. Definitely seen that name before. Um, Vrenosi, been stopped by Linus Shudofia. Yeah, that's probably where I remember it from. I'm sure that was on a Sky card, um, yeah, back in uh, in October of last year. Also, um, as I say, picked up another couple losses. Okay. Um, elsewhere on the card, really good fight between Harlem Eubank, 13-0, and another friend of the show in a 10-rounder against Sean Mashadod, who's 17-6 and with a draw. Sean Mashadod as well came up short last time out because he was kind of, well, it was really sad actually. He was in a real dark place outside of boxing and then he returned and he was trying to win that ultimate boxer tournament where they fight over three rounds and he just about lost it in the final against Corey. I think it was the final against Corey Gibbs or maybe he didn't get to the final. I can't quite remember now, but Corey Gibbs is a good fighter who went in undefeated and came out undefeated. He won the whole thing, but it was a really close fight with Corey Gibbs and and uh, Sean Dodd. I think Sean Dodd might have even done enough just to nick it. So it was a bit of a sad way for him to come back. Yeah, he did lose in the in the quarter final, I think it was. So um, yeah, gutted for him, but happy to see him get another opportunity. I just think Harlem Eubank might be a little bit too fresh, too athletic for him. We'll see. Um, Brad Pauls, 15-0 and in a 10-rounder against Ryan Kelly, who's 16-3. and Katarina Fanders, 13-1. and The one loss came to Terry Harper for the world title about a year or so ago. She gets in with uh, Gell, who's 4-6. and six. Harvey Horn as well, 9-1. and one. No opponent just yet for him. Uh, moving out now to France. It's a heavyweight fight that's been... Uh, you know, cancelled and rescheduled quite a few times. I was looking forward to it the minute it got made, and it seems like that was about a year ago, and since then, nothing's happened, and I'm so happy it's finally going ahead, but Tony Yoker, 11-0, the Olympic gold medalist, gets in with Martin Bacoli, 17-1. and The one loss came, of course, to Michael Hunter when he got stopped in the last 30 seconds of their 10-round contest in London. Um... Again, we've heard so many brilliant things about Martin Bacoli. He's going to for sure be the next heavyweight champion um, from Africa. And, you know, sparred with Joshua, done lots of things in the gym, you know, beaten up all these guys, had great sparring with Joe Joyce, given Anthony Joshua kittens in the gym. All these stories that you hear about these heavyweights, you never know what to believe. But the general consensus was that this guy had a hell of a lot of talent and was going straight to the top. And obviously got in there with Michael Hunter. I don't know what happened there. Maybe they underestimated him. Maybe Michael Hunter was just a bit better than some people over here thought he was. And um, I was there ringside for that fight. And Michael Hunter absolutely beat the hell out of him. And he didn't actually go down, did he? He actually stayed on his feet but got stopped. Um, because he couldn't defend himself in the end. He was just getting his head smashed left and right. But he's a very tough guy. So actually, I think there might be some value in that fight going the distance. Whether or not they're going to give Bacoli the decision, I'm not sure. But I, I feel like we're going to find out a hell of a lot about Bacoli and Yoko. If Yoko can come through Bacoli, especially if he can stop him, that's a major statement there. And if Bacoli can beat Yoko by taking him out or completely dominating him, then that's amazing as well. That looks good for Michael Hunter. So really interested in that fight for random reasons. But I'm going to find a way to watch that one because for me, I'm very, very interested in it. Um Moving out now, it's a random one, but I'm just going to throw it out there. It takes place in Istanbul, Turkey. Avni Yildirim, 24-4, and fighting here for the vacant WBC Asian Boxing Council uh, super middleweight title. Um, 24-4, and Yildirim. He beat in his last fight Yusuf Kangwell, who is 20-5 with a draw. And now 
they're having the rematch. I'm not sure why, because Avni Yildirim absolutely shut Kangwell out in the first fight, and they're having their second fight here, and it's for a title. So, not sure what the point of it is, but I'm sure Yildirim's going to probably pick up a WBC ranking with it, because God knows how he become uh, Canelo's mandatory that time. I mean, what the hell is going on? We don't understand these rankings. We've already said that five or six times this week. Um, moving out now to Dubai. This one, of course, is going to be on top of a hotel with a boxing ring on a helipad. It's never been done before, and who knows what the future holds. But anyways, um, main event, it's, it's an exhibition, of course. I'm not sure how many rounds it is. I haven't really been interested in how many rounds it is, how long the rounds are, if there's going to be headgear, all the rest of that stuff. Haven't looked at any of it, what the rules are going to be. But all I know is Floyd Mayweather coming back um, in the ring in an exhibition. Obviously, last time we've seen him in a ring in an exhibition was against Logan Paul, and he didn't look too good there. He gets in with Don Moore, dangerous Don Moore, who... He's actually an undefeated pro, which I don't think everyone knew. He's 18-0 and with a draw as a pro, so a real fighter from Indiana. Hasn't boxed, though, for almost six years. Um, I think he's 42 years of age now, 5'10 in height, and he was a featherweight, really, at his best. So um, even though his last fight was at 147 six years ago, or almost six years ago, so... Yeah, not sure if it's going to be much of a contest, but he is getting in with someone who can fight. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, let's move on to the undercard, the more legitimate fights. We've got Badu Jack, 25 and 3 with 3 draws. Friend of the show in a 12-rounder. No title on the line, though. He gets in with Haney Atio, who's 17 and 5. Bit of a pointless fight, really. We also see Katie Taylor, victim Delphine Pasoon, 46 and 3, having her 50th fight, the part-time Policewoman, part-time boxer. Ten two-minute rounds for the vacant WBC silver female super featherweight title against Elhem McCallid, who's 15-0. and um, Moving out now to the, um, the final... We've got three cards, actually, to go over. Let's start with this one here. I'm going to run through this one here. Um... Dignity Health Sports Park. It's going to be on Showtime. Carson, California, of course. Undercard, not really up to much apart from this one. Almost missed out on this one here. Uh, Jaron Ennis, friend of the show, back in action. 28-0 in a 12-rounder against Custio Clayton. 19-0 with a draw. I want to say Clayton is like ranked somewhere in the very top of one of the rankings. So maybe this is some kind of eliminator. I'd guess it probably is. I think it could be an eliminator for Errol Spence's IBF title, maybe. Or maybe I'm just completely making it up. But anyway, should be a good fight. Two undefeated fighters getting on, uh, getting it on. So, um, yeah, all the best to Ennis, friend of the show. And the main event, Jamel Charlo, 34-1 and with a draw. Defending all four of the major titles. An undisputed fight. We always love them in boxing. He gets in with Brian Castaño of Argentina. 17-0 and with two draws, both men. Held, uh, held on to their undefeated. No, not undefeated, because Charlo does have that one loss, doesn't he, to Harrison, which he avenged. I almost forgot. But anyway, both guys managed to um, to not lose, not win, and they had a draw. It was very controversial. Most people felt Castaño did enough to win, and they're getting it on again. So credit to both guys. Credit more so to Charlo for wanting that rematch and wanting to. You know, to prove that that was a little bit of a hiccup like he did against Harrison. So, very, very intrigued to see how it's going to play out. Um, so tough, really. So, so tough to pick a winner. Remember, Castaño had a real good amateur career, beat uh, some real good fighters in the amateurs, including Errol Spence. Um, so, yeah, great, great fight there. Cannot wait to see it unfold. This one, I think, is going to be on Fight TV at the Forum in Inglewood, California. This one over here, um, Fernando Vargas Jr., 5-0 in a six-rounder against Terence Harmon, who is 3-0. Uh, we've got Amado Vargas, who's 3-0 in a four-rounder against... <laughs> wow, I'm actually not going to say this guy's name because I almost swore. Uh, yeah, he's got a record of... one. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Should I just say it, Eddie? Absolutely. I think you should. <laughs> or try. Okay, so... 
Yeah, so Amado Vargas 3 and 0 in a four rounder against Anal Dudo. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no! His name is not Anal. Ah, oh, you can't say that. Oh, I like hey, the, Joe. the surname. The, the s- Dudo. Anal. Ah, Dudo. Oh, that could be Anal Dudo too. If yeah. you want to do. Oh yeah, man! You know what? Let's stop. Let's stop with the name. Let's stop. You know, this dude could be a serious fighter. One and three as a pro. Um, I wish it was like naught and two or two and two just to yeah, anyways let's move away from that one also Emiliano Vargas as well making his pro debut over four rounds against Mark Salgado so we've got I think all three of Fernando Vargas's sons fighting on this card here amazing talking of famous sons Evan Holyfield as well nine and oh in a six rounder against Jermaine McDonald who's six and five We've got Kubrat Pulev, 28-2 in a 10-rounder against Jerry Forrest, 26-4 with two draws coming off that loss. Not that loss, that draw with Michael Hunter last time out. In a fight where um, you could argue that he did enough to beat Hunter, to be honest, even though Hunter beat him com- convincingly seven years, I think it was seven years prior. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a few behind the scenes things as to why Michael didn't look as good as what he should have done in that second fight that I'm referencing to here but that's nothing to do with Forrest and Forrest you know looked really 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 good to be honest in that fight there so him against Kubrat Pulev who's got to be about 41 or something now could be interesting to be honest with you so yeah maybe there's some value in Jerry Forrest but Jerry Forrest has let me down a few times when I've fancied him as an underdog um but yeah we'll see we'll see he's in good form and the main event Sergei Kovalev 34 and 4 with a draw in a 10 rounder at cruiserweight against Tavel Pulev the undefeated younger brother of Kubrat Pulev even though he's his younger brother he's still about 39 years of age 16 and 0 the cruiserweight uh, Sergei Kovalev again moving up in weight packing on the uh, those 25 pounds. It's going to be interesting to see what he looks like. I think you've got a probably edge to Kovalev. He's 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 a favourite, but it's it's kind of close on the on the you know when I've looked at it. And I want to say that Pulev would probably still be older than Kovalev in terms of his age. Probably not in terms of the mileage on the clock. But that's just it's just a weird fight that I'm going to definitely try and tune into. And then the final card to mention, it takes place at the Toyota Arena in Ontario, California, USA. Um, it's going to be on the zone. Um, uh, the undercard, one real good fight to mention. I think there's no way that this fight is going to disappoint when it comes to action. We've got William Zapida, always in a great fight, 25-0, and in a 10-rounder against Rene Alvarado, former world champion, 32-11. and um, you'd obviously have to favour Zapida. I think he's going to be much fresher and stronger. Looks unbelievable. Looks unstoppable, to be honest, at the moment. Um, people are talking about him getting in with someone like Javante Davis. Like People are kind of excited about the potential fight there. It's for the WBA Continental America's lightweight title, but I think that's going to be uh, full of action. And the main event, Gilberto Ramirez. Uh, 30, no, way past that, 43 and 0. Um, getting in with Dominic Bozell, 32-2. and two. I think Bozell, German fighter, I believe, could have been a former European champion. He was around about European level at the peak of his powers. Um, two losses, can't remember who they were to now, but I think they were for European titles in a 12-rounder here against Ramirez. Earlier this week, um, Oscar De La Hoya, Gilberto Ramirez's um, promoter, I think just was joking around with the media when he said that they're going to try to get Ramirez to 40, sorry, to 52 and 0 and then retire just to beat um just to beat Floyd's record but at the same time you never know what to believe with Oscar De La Hoya when it comes to Floyd because there's a bit of an agenda there and the way they've been moving Ramirez how on earth he's got to 43 and 0 um you know with that thin resume I'll never ever know I know he's from, you know, the tough, mean streets of Mexico, and he hasn't had it easy. I think, you know, he's he, he hasn't had it easy, to be honest. He, he didn't get to the top level for a long, long time. He had to do a lot 
uh, to, to kind of get noticed, really. Um, and I want to say, like, he's had a long pro career. I don't think he did too much as an amateur. I kind of had to learn on the job when he turned pro, if I'm not mistaken. But, um, but yeah, you know, he's he, he is good. He's a really good fighter. And I'm not sure why he isn't boxing for world titles, because he was a world champion when he was at, um, was it 168? I think he was at. And he beat Jesse Hart a couple of times there. Jesse Hart pushed him close as well. And then, yeah, moves up to 175 and just doesn't decide to uh, be be placed in that mandatory position, which you can do. If you're a WBO champion, you move up in weight. You can be put straight in as the mandatory if you want to. And you'll get a shot very quickly. He decided to not do that. So you never know. Maybe they really are going for 52 and, uh, 52 and 0. We shall see. And it's going to be challenging to get there because, again, I've seen little things in his recent fights where he doesn't seem to be the same fighter he was maybe five years ago so we shall see so there's a lot of fights on this weekend whether you're going to be tuning into um into what's going down in paris between tony yoko and martin bacoli or you're going to be tuning into what's going down in dubai with dangerous don moore and floyd mayweather whether you're going to be tuning into california uh what's going down there in carson california on showtime between charlo and castagno probably the best fight really of the weekend uh great to see that rematch you know, finally taking place. Obviously, Jaron Ennis on the undercard in a great fight, two undefeated fighters. Or you might be tuning into, as I say, the Kovalev and Pulev card. I think we're going to have Cypress Hill doing some kind of performance as well on Fight TV for that one. Or will you be watching the zone with Gilberto Ramirez, one of the longest win streaks currently in boxing, uh, trying to get to 44 and 0 against Dominic Bozell of Germany? Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. But anyway, that brings the preview part to a close. The final thing for me to do before we wrap up the show is to come in with the outro, which I'll do in just a few seconds. Okay, and this wraps up episode 343 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A huge thank you to our special guest, the reigning and undefeated IBF and WBC super lightweight female world champion, Chantel Cameron. The biggest thanks of all, though, goes out to you, the listeners. There has been one piece of news break whilst we've been recording the show. Friend of the show, Jessica McCaskill, will be defending her undisputed crown against Alma Ibarra as part of that Rodriguez rung the Sander card. Once again, that is June 25th, live on The Zone in San Antonio, Texas. But that's about everything from myself. Enjoy your weekends, people. Stay safe, and we shall see you all again next week.